नमस्कार मैं संदीप गर्ग एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर इन आई बी बी आई आई दिस इज़ वन ऑफ द लास्ट सेशन इन दिस सीरीज ऑफ सेशंस आई इन दिस सेशन आई विल टेक यू ऑन द जर्नी ऑफ आई बी सी इंसॉलवेंसी एंड बैंक करप्सी कोड द जर्नी डन सो फार एंड वॉट इज़ द रोड अहेड सो आई विल ट्राई टू कवर ए लार्ज अमाउंट ऑफ इंफॉर्मेशन इन दिस सेशन सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट मी गिव यू ए बैकग्राउंड ऑफ द लीगल एंड रेगुलेटरी फ्रेमवर्क विच वॉज प्रिवलेंट इन इंडिया फॉर डीलिंग विद स्ट्रेस डेट्स एंड दिस फ्रेमवर्क वॉज देयर बिफोर द आई बी सी केम इन टू बींग सो इन नाइनटीन एटी फाइव Sikh Industrial Companies Act Special Provisions Act was enacted the objective of this act was to revive the sikh industrial companies it was done with a view to uh, provide the revival of sikh industrial companies it was done with the view to keep the enterprises ongoing so that the the workmen and the capital does not suffer in 1993 another act was enacted recovery of debt due to banks and financial institutions this was done with a view to provide recovery to the banks and financial institutions because it was felt that sika is not able to achieve its objectives of recovery to the financial institutions so this act was enacted this act led to the establishment of debt recovery tribunals and debt recovery appellate tribunals and after this act then in uh, 2003 2003 of uh, 2002 surface act was enacted so uh, this was felt that even rdd bfi act is not able to cater to the recovery of banks and uh, the enforcement of security was allowed for the security creditors for secured creditors direct action by by direct action by them and only the appeal of that will lie with drt so this was the regime prevailing before the ibc came into being besides this regime uh rbi has also been dealing with the uh, management of stress assets they had come out with corporate debt restructuring scheme in 2001 so it provided a mechanism for monitoring the net uh, the non performing assets and way to resolve them but this was not very successful so they come up came up with another scheme of revitalizing the distressed assets in the ecosystem even that scheme was replaced subsequently it led to flexible restructuring of long term project loans and then another scheme of strategic debt restructuring and then as for a scheme so a series of schemes were launched by rbi after seeing that it is they are getting mixed response but the uh, reactions were mixed the gross npas were still climbing up so a need was felt that we have to deal with the problem of insolvency comprehensively and to deal with that ibc was enacted in 2016 so now uh, uh, this uh, uh, dwelling further on this dysfunctional insolvency regime as i said earlier sika was enacted with a view to help the debtor the company as well as the workmen so while implementing the sika type 2 error was committed because the companies that were not viable they were continued for long in rdd bfi act this recovery of debt due to banks and financial act 
uh, Financial Institutions Act. The primary objective was recovery. And in surfacey, it was recovery for the secured creditors. So in both these acts, which were with a view keeping in, keeping in mind the interest of creditors, type one error was committed, where even viable enterprises were forced to wind up as their productive assets were taken away. And enforcement of these acts required multiple judicial forums. And this was a situation where one set of judicial authority were hearing the rights of uh, the acts related to rights of creditors. Another set of judicial authorities were hearing the SICA appeals. And because of that, there was a lot of litigation and the judgments were being readily challenged in higher forums and being state. So there was no further uh, action which was resulting because of implementation of these acts. So optimum insolvency path required that we provide a comprehensive legislation which deals with the interest of both creditors as well as the company. And we do so in such a manner that both type 1 and type 2 errors are minimized. That is, the firms where probability of their recovery is very, very low, they, they should be liquidated as fast as possible, while the companies which can be revived should be revived. So now, this kind of situation basically led to the genesis of IBC. There was a, basically in 2016, the atmosphere prevailing was that India was needing a lot of investments and they were requiring an atmosphere of high competition and innovation so that India can achieve higher growth and fulfill the dreams of its people. So, but the economy was facing twin balance sheet problem. The banks, NPAs, gross NPAs, which were 4.3% in March 2015, they rose up to 9% in September 2016, and they rose till, say, 2017. And also, the companies who were to service the debts of these banks, they were also not having enough capacity. They were having just sufficient income. And their interest coverage ratio, which basically determines that how much are the profits with in relation to interest, how much are the profits, whether they are able to service their interest or not, that ratio went down below 1 by 2015. So they were not able to service their debt. So... The companies, uh, there was no freedom of exit. Companies were uh, mired in a check review. They were not able to come out. Even the companies which was very, very sure that they are not able to come uh, come out, they have to shut down. Even they were, uh, they were not being able to wound up. And because of that, the ease of doing business was suffering. India's ranking, as I'll show in the statistics later, was quite low. So we needed a comprehensive solution uh, for dealing with these uh, situations. So a bankruptcy law reforms committee was formed in 2015, and the mandate was that we enact a comprehensive economic insolvency law which deals with all aspects of insolvency. So protect uh, the... So, Supreme Court in Arcelor Mittal case has basically said that previous legislation, namely the Sikh Industrial Companies Act 1985 and the Recovery of Debt Due to Banks and Financial Institutions Act 1993, which made provision for rehabilitation of Sikh companies and repayment of loans availed by them, were found to have completely failed. This was the observation of Supreme Court in Arsal Mittal case. So, 
with after the formation of blrc uh, this code was enacted this code was uh, the draft of this code was given as an extra to the uh, as, as volume 2 of the report volume 1 contained uh, all the uh, all the reasons why why the why the code should be like uh, how it should be framed what should be the reasoning what should be the structure around it what are the best practices being followed internationally so so long title of the code is and it says all the things which the code is meant for it says reorganization and insolvency resolution of corporate persons in a time bound manner for maximization of value of assets of corporates so maximization of value is the main principle behind this act the main principle for which all the pillars of ibc are working and this ultimately leads to promotion of entrepreneurship it also improves availability of credit as creditors realize their loans they the credit becomes available to further uh, disbursement and then it balances the interest of all stakeholders uh, government also took a very bold step in changing the priority of payments earlier uh, this priority of payments commonly known as waterfall required that government dues uh, had the supreme priority and they were to be paid but government is an institution which can take uh, a haircut because it's a it's a uh, institution which is able to survive which is able to uh, fill its coffers uh, by other means also by raising revenues also while there are stressed assets which are lying uh, unproductive and which basically hurts the economy much more than the loss of revenue and this act also provided for establishment of insolvency and bankruptcy board of india and these objectives which i have narrated above this this has been held to be sacrosanct by anklet in the matter of binani industries so with these objectives the this code was formed this code required a so there was a paradigm shift between the framework which was prevalent before ibc and after ibc so as i said earlier there were multiple legislation sika rdd bbfi act surface while all these were combined together and a insolvency legislation came into being which is single legislation ibc uh, rdd bfi act and surface still remain but their use has become much less after this sika had been repealed objective of uh, earlier regime was basically either rehabilitation or recovery but now the objective main objective of ibc is resolution so the approach which was being adopted earlier was that the management and promoters of the company remained in possession while here in ibc approach is that creditor comes in control so what happens in a situation is that once the promoter is not able to pay its dues then it loses the right to manage that company because his liability is limited promoter's liability is limited you, he can't be made answerable to the losses of the company net worth is eroded if it is in loss while creditors are still to lose their money so it is the creditors who should be in control of the company once a situation has come to a pass and it has entered into insolvency so as i said earlier earlier the government dues were highest while now the government dues are below financial creditors but they are above operational creditors so uh, earlier the situation was that there was no moratorium so moratorium is that there is a stay on all the proceedings nobody can recover its dues nobody can institute a suit or uh, uh, start court proceedings against this so what happens is that 
once it is known to the market that somebody is going to default, then everybody rushes in to recover his money. So in, in these kinds of situations, it becomes impossible to run a business. So moratorium helps by saying that, okay, now everybody has to stop. Nobody can recover its money. We will give money to all by gradually recovering the money to in such a manner that all are satisfied. So there is no rush to liquidate, to uh, no rush on the assets of the corporate debtor so that not even, uh, it doesn't happen that even productive assets are taken away. So uh, another paradigm shift was that the, the timelines were specified for everything, timelines for admission of application, timeline for uh, asking for uh, for preparing the information memorandum, timeline for resolution. So all the timelines, et cetera, have been specified in the code, which was not there earlier. Another thing which happens was that in earlier, the, when the promoter remained in control, then even then the assets of the company were being stripped off. Now in this case, what happens is that a resolution professional becomes in charge of the company. And one becomes in charge of the company and ensures that no assets are taken away. Not only that, the, if the promoters have stripped some assets, even those are brought back in the fold and it acts not only ex poste, but ex ante as well. Because if there, somebody knows that later on his acts will be caught and assets will in any case be taken away, then it prevents uh, promoters from taking away those assets. And this provides a cleanliness also. So what happens is now uh, the section 29A, I'll come to it later, was introduced, which said that certain ineligible uh, persons cannot take over the company. So if a promoter is an ineligible person, he has not paid the loans for a particular period of time, or he's a willful defaulter, then he can't come and get, get the company. This court also was a shift in that, that there was a uh, insolvency professional which was thought of, that he will run the company. So again, it was a significant departure from previous approaches. Uh, a, a cadre of insolvency professional was thought of, and uh, uh, to manage them again, uh, in IBBI was created, that we create a cadre of insolvency professionals and regulate them. Insolvency professional agencies were created, so that they become a front right, uh, frontline regulators of insolvency professionals and train them and monitor them. And uh, this, this, all this mechanism was provided so that markets dominate. Decision, most of the decisions are with the market. Earlier the decisions were with the state. Here all the decisions were with the market. It is the information memorandum which is prepared, prepared and resolution plans are received from the market, and it is the committee of creditors whose money is to be recovered, they decide that whether this plan is okay or not. So in a way, it was a paradigm shift from earlier approaches. So structure of the code, the code had basically five parts and schedules, uh, part, one is preliminary, part two dealt with corporate insolvency resolution process, part three deals with insolvency resolution of individuals and partnership firms. So part three has not yet been fully operationalized, only a portion of this which deals with personal guarantors that has been operationalized. And uh, then there are is, there is a, uh, part four provides for regulation of insolvency professionals, agencies, and information utility, utilities. And then there are miscellaneous provisions in part five. Schedules are in respect of the provisions of other acts which are being changed while by uh, this IBC Act. So this is the timeline of implementation of the code. Uh, in May 2016, code was enacted. ANCLAT and NCLT were established companies under the Companies Act in 2016. 
June 2016 and then IBBI was established in October 2016. We just completed uh, five years, six years of our existence. In December 2016, relations corporate insolvency resolution provisions were started. Then corporate liquidation provisions were in, commenced from December 2016. In March 2017, provisions relating to financial service providers insolvency were commenced. And then uh, personal guarantors to corporate debtor. This is one category of individuals and partnership firms whose the provisions have been started. So, uh, uh, on this IBC, our Honorable Prime Minister has basically said, Satyo, Aajkal Insolvency Bankruptcy Court ki itni charcha hoti hai, lekin yeh sirf itna paisa wapas aya, utna paisa wapas aya, yahan tak hi simit rehti hai, lekin woh usse bhi aage hai. आप सभी यह बेहतर जानते हैं कि कुछ स्थितियों में धंधे से बाहर निकलना ही कई बार समझदारी माना जाता है यह जरूरी नहीं है कि जो कंपनी सफल ना हो रही हो उसके पीछे कोई साजिश हो कोई गलत इरादा हो कोई लालच हो यह जरूरी नहीं है देश में ऐसे उद्यमियों के लिए एक रास्ता तैयार करना आवश्यकता था और आईबीसी ने इसका आधार तय किया तैयार किया आज नहीं तो कल इस बात पर अध्ययन जरूरी होगा कि आईबीसी ने कितने भारतीय उद्यमियों का भविष्य बचाया और उन्हें हमेशा के लिए बर्बाद होने से रोका सो दिस इज व्हाट द ऑनरेबल पीएम हैड सेड अबाउट आईबीसी फॉर ऑपरेशनलाइजिंग दिस कोड वी रिक्वायर्ड लॉट ऑफ न्यू entities to be created, a lot of new institutions to be created. So as I said, as we see, there were two benches of Nanklet, they were created. Then one principal bench plus 15 jurisdictional benches of National Company Law Tribunal, they were created. Uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, it was established as a regulator. Then there was service providers which were being regulated. They were, uh, the one NESL is there. Then there are three insolvency professional agencies. These insolvency professional agencies were created by tie-ups with the Chartered Accountant Institute, Company Secretary Institute, and Cost and Management Accountant Institute. So within very less short span of time, we, we were able to create uh, the capacity of insolvency professionals. And now we have around 4,000 plus professional uh, insolvency professionals. We have 16 registered value or organizations. We have more than 5,000 plus registered valuers, which are being regulated by IBBI. Uh, I'll take you through the corporate insolvency resolution process so that you can understand basically how how the process uh, is uh, undergone, how the uh, resolution of the companies happens. So what happens is, once the company has been admitted into insolvency, the uh, a interim pro pro resolution professional is appointed and the process begins. Once this is admitted, then moratorium also comes into play. Now, nobody can recover its money. No money can be paid to any creditors. And this creates an environment where resolution can happen. Also, it is mandated that all the essential supplies, all the business goes as usual. It should not happen that business is hampered. So all essential supplies, all critical supplies, they, they continue. The insolvency professional, after coming into his saddle, he then issues a public announcement and then uh, he receives claims in response to this public announcement. After collation of those claims, he knows that how much money is to be paid to what, what is the position of each creditor. So based on how much uh, 
percentage share each creditor is having in the total uh, total debt then the voting share of uh, coc committee of creditors is decided and then he constitutes a committee of creditor and a meeting of committee of creditor takes place and this committee of creditors basically acts as a board of directors of the company during the period uh, uh, insolvency resolution is taking place all they take all the major decisions while this insolvency professional uh, runs the day to day activity of the company and also day to day process of uh, the insolvency process also he runs he acts as the ceo of the company so this interim resolution professional this was chosen by the creditor who had filed this application for admission but now when all the creditors have come into place they may like to even replace him they may continue with him or they may like to replace the him so once they confirm him he becomes a resolution professional otherwise he is replaced and another resolution professional takes over this resolution professional then looks at all the liabilities all the material contracts of the company and prepares a information memorandum this mem information memorandum is a very important document which is then given to the market that they can see and find, give resolution plans so the resolution applicants are encouraged so that they can come and tell that what are the, their resolution plans first of all he invites the expression of interest and after inviting expression of interest he finds that these are the prospective bidders he issues information memorandum to them uh, he requests for resolution plans from them after receipt of plans he says whether these plans are compliant and all the compliant plans are then given to the committee of creditors for approval once committee of creditor approves a plan this plan is submitted to the adjudicating authority which is the national company law tribunal uh, for approval and if there are no such plans then in that case the company is liquidated the company then enters a liquidation phase so the first priority of the code is resolution if that does not happen then then it go enters into a liquidation phase liquidation process this a approval of the plan by the adjudicating authority ensures that there is a judicial oversight of the whole process there were several amendments which have been carried out to keep the spirits of the code alive and uh, uh, the government has been very very responsive whenever a situation has happened in the market that uh, this requires uh, uh, some amendment to deal with a particular kind of a situation that they have been done very swiftly so first amendment had basically categorized this uh, individuals and firms into three categories they they were categorized into personal guarantors and another business concerns the partnership and proprietorship firms and other individuals so they were categorized into three categories this categorization made possible that this part 3 is operated only in respect of personal guarantors because still uh, the code is not, not fully operational as i say part 3 is on, only operational in respect of personal guarantors the institutions are being tested even for this so probably with the learning of uh, this insolvency resolution for corporates we will proceed further and then implement the code the part 3 of the code as well another amendment which took place was in respect of section 29a this uh, basically prevented uh, the un ineligible persons from being the resolution applicants so some of the disqualifications were that if somebody is a willful defaulter he is not paying the loan willfully then he can't be a resolution applicant if somebody has npa for more than one year he can't be a resolution applicant somebody is prohibited from trading in securities by sebi he can't be a resolution applicant somebody has been convicted of an offense for more than of of a uh, sentenced for more than two years he can't be a resolution applicant then uh, somebody who has been uh, Uh, who has been 
in case of avoidance, some avoidance transactions have been uh, identified against him. And uh, A passes an order that uh, he's, uh, he has done those avoidance transactions, then he can't be a resolution applicant. So persons with doubtful antecedents have been prevented. This, this actually enabled the shift companies. Earlier, the promoters were taking for granted that nobody can take over the companies uh, from them. And when the companies were taken over from big corporates, it was very became very clear that if the companies do not pay their debts in time and they default and they regularly default and they willfully default, then they will be the man, they will these companies will go out of their management and control this really created a sense of discipline among them so this uh, after this first amendment second amendment was again brought through ordinance and uh, this act was passed in act in 2018 here uh, again a significant amendment was that home buyers were made financial creditors so in one of the judgments uh, supreme court has held chitra sharma versus Union of India in the case of JP Infra, it was held that uh, they are the persons who are, these allottees are the persons who are giving money to the corporates and they should be considered as financial creditors. So in response to that judgment, the home buyers were made uh, financial creditors. In fact, Insolvency Law Committee was already considering the suggestion based on some previous judgments of Anklet. And uh, after this judgment, the amendment bec became it was brought quickly by way of an ordinance. Also, some other uh, uh, key amendments were taken up. The voting threshold was reduced from 75% to 66% for major decisions and 51% for ordinary decisions. So it was felt that basically uh, uh, what is happening is that uh, approval of a resolution plan requires a voting threshold of 75%. So what was happening was that in some cases, uh, because of the voting percentage being so some, so high, the companies were being liquidated. That the resolutions plans were not getting approved. They were getting say 70 percent, but not getting 75 percent. So because of that, they were getting liquidated. So from seeing this, this experience, basically this amendment was brought. Then uh, Supreme Court has also intervened in one case. Uh, that there was no provision that somebody can withdraw the corporate insolvency resolution process. So even if somebody wanted to pay something, pay the loan, but even then the withdrawal was not happening. And uh, because of that, some such cases were getting piled up in Supreme Court. So Supreme Court in one of the cases suggested that the government should look at it and provide for a withdrawal provision. So a withdrawal provision was provided that when 90% of the creditors decide that no, we should withdraw this process, then uh, the process would be withdrawn. Then some guarantors were taking advantage of the moratorium. That uh, Some of the judgments came. Most, most prevalent view was this personal guarantors. They are not, uh, they can't take the benefit of moratorium, but few judgments came because of this uh, because of this, it became necessary to amend that personal guarantors are not protected by moratorium. So if a company has given loan, taken a loan from a bank, and it has been guaranteed by its promoters, then it is a well-established law that proceedings can be initiated against the company as well as against the promoters. And promoters should not be protected because that's a coextensive liability they suffer. So this was clarified through this amendment. Then uh, uh, the special regime was uh, brought up for uh, mic me uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So section 29A was relaxed for SME, MSMEs. Uh, it's not that all in an ineligibilities have been relaxed, but few ineligibilities like a personal guarantor in a case where the person has defaulted, uh, those ineligibility as well as the ineligibility in respect of NPA being more than one year. That has been relaxed by Section 240A. Besides, this has created a special regime for MSMEs where the government has been given the power 
to that they can notify some that some of the provisions will specifically apply to MSMEs and some of the provisions will not apply to MSMEs. So this special regime has been created uh, in respect of MSMEs. Uh, again, Limitation Act has been made applicable to IBC. Then uh, third amendment, almost we had uh, one amendment every year. In the third amendment, one of the key amendments was that the process should be completed in 330 days. So what it requires is that the timelines have been specified in the code that process has to be completed in 180 days. And if it is not completed in 180 days, then one extension of 90 days can be granted. So the whole process has to be completed in 270 days. But Supreme Court in a matter has uh, ruled that judicial time taken uh, while the proceedings are stayed, all this time should be excluded. So I mean, an amendment was brought that even after including judicial time, time should not exceed 330 days. But even this provision which was brought has been held to be directory. But the courts have been directed that extension should happen only in exceptional cases. Then uh, another provision was made that if the admission of the application, uh, timeline has been provided that the NCLT has to decide the admission of application in 14 days. And if they do, are not able to decide, then they have to re record their reasons in writing. Another amendment which was brought was that there has to be a fair and equitable distribution of the resolution proceeds. So same category of uh, creditor should get the same percentage of the loans collected. So their satisfaction ratio should be same. And this committee of creditors, which I mentioned earlier, this is constituted by financial creditor. So operational creditors are not part of this committee. So they are not in the decision making seat. Also, some of the creditors may not agree with the majority decision of COC. So they become dissenting financial creditor. So to ensure that these operational creditors who are not part of COC, committee of creditors, and the dissenting financial creditors who are not agreeing with the majority decision, they should be, their interest should be protected for that it was made that they should be given some minimum, some liquidation value, they should be given a minimum, a minimum entitlement were defined. Then uh, it was said that in case, cases of classes of creditors, the decision will be by present and voting. And then resolution plan was made binding on everyone. It was specifically said that it will apply on government authorities as well. Then uh, in two, again in end of 2019, uh, we had the fourth amendment. And basically it was, uh, here we said that, that there will not be, it was basically there but it was specifically clarified that there will not be any termination of licenses, permits, and grants. So any company which are, say, doing mining, its license to mine should not be terminated because of insolvency. If it is able to pay its current dues, then it should not be terminated. Then uh, Section 32A provided immunity from past misdeeds. So th the new promoters and the company, they are, have been, they are provided immunity from past offenses of the company. The, while the old promoters are still liable, but the new promoters have been provided this immunity. Then uh, uh, for uh, resolution of financial service providers also, the, uh, the regime was facilitated. After COVID, the fifth amendment was brought and this basically uh, prevented initiation of uh, insolvency proceedings for six months period and then subsequently increased uh, so so that it does not happen that because of COVID if people are not able to pay even then the insolvency is initiated. Then after COVID also it was felt that we should probably encourage bring a regime so that MSMEs have a uh, better process 
So prepackaged insolvency regime was created in respect of uh, uh, corporate MSME. This prepackaged scheme was basically uh, both a formal as well as uh, informal scheme. So it is informal up to a point where the promoter as well as 66% uh, of the creditors, they basically decide that what should be the plan, how should you go about it, and uh, they submit it, and the admission of the uh, insolvency process is then initiated, and then it, the process becomes formal. Here, debtor remains in possession. It's not the resolution professional who is taking the day-to-day um, -day decision, but it is the insolvency professional, but it is the uh, promoter who is running the business, but process is being run by insolvency professional, and it is the committee of creditors who is taking that decisions. So uh, a, in this scheme, basically, a preference has been given to the promoter. So he basically gives a base resolution plan. But this base resolution plan, if it is not sufficiently better than other plans being offered by other resolution applicants, then this plan can be challenged by others. And then promoters has to match this. If he can't match it, then the company goes to a person who offers a better value, again maximizing the value. So within the basic structure of the code, which is basically the creditors remain in control, it is the COC which takes the major decisions, and then they're, 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 the moratorium remains available so that there is a not a run on the company, and then there is a binding nature of the approved resolution plan so that everybody takes a haircut, and after that, the dues of the company are absolved. He, the company is new company, no, new promoters, or the company is absolved of past dues. So the, the resolution plan becomes binding. All these crucial elements still are still there. This, as I said, it commences with 60% majority, the consent of majority of the financial creditors, and a special majority of shareholders. Resolution professional sees the process, not the business. Committee of creditors decides the matters, commercial matters. And this process, because there is a lot of legwork which has already been done, this has been mandated to be completed in 90 days. And then there are adequate checks and balances to prevent any abuse. So in uh, one of the largest cases, one of the most successful uh, cases, uh, this uh, it is SR Steel. And uh, uh, in this case, basically, we had a realization percentage, 77 percent of the uh, claims they were realized. So this IBC, what has been the outcome of IBC? There has been a very, very positive impact on the credit culture. Uh, as you can see from the statistics before you, that almost 85 percent of the cases are getting resolved in the way. What is happening is that applications are filed, and then in many cases, the promoters of the company come for settlement. That there is a credible threat that they will lose management of the company, control of the company. So most of the cases they are settled. So out of 38,000 cases, you can see all, almost 22,000 cases have been withdrawn before admission. Around 10,000 cases are pending. Process has commenced in about 5,500 cases plus. Also, even after admission, some of the cases have been closed. Around 1,500 cases have been closed midway, where, wherein I mentioned no, the withdrawal of the insolvency can happen with 90% majority of uh, uh, committee of creditor. So in 1,500 cases, these cases have been settled either with withdrawal or by appeal, etc. So the process where uh, in the liquidation, we have got around 1,30,000 crores. In resolution, we have got 2,35,000 crores. Mm -hmm. Ongoing processes are around 2,000 processes which are ongoing. This has basically brought a major shift uh, in the behavior of promoters of the company. As you can see here, Almost 22,000 cases have been, more than 22,000 cases have been withdrawn before admission itself. 
and these involved a significant amount of 7 lakh crores, more than 7 lakh crores. And these are claims of only those creditors who had filed that application. So if we, uh, if we, if they would have come into insolvency and invited claims from other creditors, this amount would have been even much larger. So this success, this basically drawn a comment from uh, uh, the Honorable FM at that point of time, FM and uh, Minister of Corporate Affairs, that uh, this early process through the IBC process has been extremely satisfactory. It has changed the debtor-creditor relationship. The creditor no longer changes the debtor. In fact, it is otherwise. So, so the equation was completely changed. So rescue of uh, distressed assets. Again, the figures are astounding here. So what we can see is that lot of lot lot of assets have been resolved. Two lakh thirty five thousand crore worth of assets have been resolved. Uh, around thirty percent, thirty one percent claims have been satisfied. Average time which has been taken is uh, four sixty days, and while the cost of resolution, the resolution cost is quite low. It's less than one percent. The Liquidation has happened in a lot of companies. As you can see, they, they outnumber the companies which have been resolved. But the, we were having legacy of cases. The, the, company, the cases which were earlier there in SICA, they were all transferred to IBC. So in all such cases, uh, uh, most of the cases liquidation have happened. So there have been an improvement in NPA. NPA scenario has basically increased. Uh, NPA has uh, continuously come down. This was 11.2% in financial year 17-18. It has come down to 5 point, less than 6% in June 2022. The graph also shows that uh, IBC has contributed a lot in the recovery of assets. So this graph basically shows the share of NPA which has been recovered through various mechanisms like IBC, surface low low etc. So in uh, 2021, you can see that there is a dip in IBC. So basically there was, uh, there was a, uh, the cases were not being admitted in IBC while other recovery actions were still being uh, taken. So they, that explains that dip. Also, what has happened is that uh, there has been uh, resolution applicants have not been coming forward. The distressed asset market has also taken a hit because of uh, constraint of liquidity, etc. People are uh, shy, so investments have dried up. So, if we see the outcome, so we can see that uh, the withdrawal of applications, they have contrib contributed to about 7,30,000 crores. 2,35,000 crores have been uh, resolved through resolution and liquidation has contributed to about 3,000 crores and 4,400 crore, 4, crores worth of assets have been voluntarily liquidated. So, total has been, uh, total must, this total is probably wrong. So, total is around 10 lakh crores worth of assets have been uh, recovered, realized through IBC. Uh, so Supreme Court in Swiss Raban, seeing these outcomes, had remarked, we are happy to note that in the working of the code, the flow of financial resources to the commercial sector in India has increased exponentially as a result of financial debt being repaid. The experiment conducted in enacting the code is proving to be largely successful. The defaulter's paradise is lost in its place the economy's rightful position has been regained. Uh, India also gained in global recognition and rankings. Our ranking in insolvency indicator was 136 in 2017 and uh, it came down to 52 in 2020. And this was a big contributor for India's score in World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. 
uh, the outcomes are ranks improved from 136 to 52. Recovery rate increased significantly. Recovery time declined significantly. Uh, we won the Global Restructuring Review Award for the most improved jurisdiction in 2018. And Global Innovation Index, India's position in case of resolving insolvency improved from 95 in 2015 to 47 in 2020. So this has, uh, IBC has been able to significantly improve India's position. Uh, this code has been able to change the behavior of promoters. It has been able to rescue lives of companies. It has ensured utilization of resources in an optimum manner, which has basically indirectly contributed for development of entrepreneurship and development of credit market. And I also contributed in the interest rates coming down. There are other factors, but this is also one of the factors which has contributed in the same. So in the economic survey, seeing all this in 2021-22 economic survey, uh, it, the, it has been said that fact that a CD may change hands has changed the behavior of debtors. Thousands of debtors are resolving distress in the early stages of distress, either when the default is imminent on receipt of a notice for repayment, but before filing an application, or after filing the application, but before its admission, and even after admission of the application and making best effort to avoid consequences of the resolution process. So impact on the economy has been positive. Uh, impact on creditors has also been positive. Uh, financial creditors have also behaved very responsibly. They are now initiating the insolvency process well in time. They have also been beneficiary of higher realization and lower NPS as a consequence. There have been enhanced realization for operational creditors also. In fact, most of the applications, 74% of the applications have been filed by operational creditors. And not only that, uh, the withdrawal rate is much more in case of op uh, applications being filed by operational creditors, which is basically indicating that most of them are getting settled and uh, because maybe their loans are smaller loans and so the promoters are able to uh, settle those loans easily and hence it is leading to withdrawal of the application. And they are realizing the proceedings even after serving the notice. Even this performance is not in fact been captured in IBC because in case of operational creditors, first of all, they have to give a notice to the company that my d debt has not been paid. Uh, this is a notice. If you don't respond to this notice or if you don't repay my dues, then I'll go to IBC. So if a dispute is resolved, if the, he, he gets paid before uh, initiation of the process, then this is not even captured in the statistics which I have given you. But market tells that this is happening. Then there has been impact on corporate debtors as well, companies as well. There has been a responsible behavior on their part. This has led to revival of companies. Uh, more than, a um, lot many companies have been revived, either they either through uh, resolution or liquidation or voluntary liquidation. Moratorium helps in a big way because, because that uh, basically prevents institution of proceedings. It, it enables that business goes as a uh, going concern. Then the clean slate principle, which was brought in by Section 32A by way of amendment, it basically states that the new promoters which come in, they are not responsible for past liabilities. And this has basically created a lot of certainty and brought them in. Then uh, uh, there have been uh, uh, some of the systems and uh, it has established certain structures like committee of creditors. It has an institution has been created. It is unregulated and probably there is a need for code of conduct for creditors. 
so uh, there has been some discussion on this issue and there is a need for capacity building so that they take adequate decisions then one of the main markets one of the main gain of this code has been development of insolvency professionals so here a new cadre of professionals called insolvency professional has been created which is regulated by ibbi and then insolvency professional agencies uh in fact in economic survey again it was remarked that with the enactment of ibc india has witnessed the birth of two professions namely the insolvency profession and the valuation profession that have professional insolvency services this has created markets for services of insolvency professionals registered valuers insolvency professional entities and expanded the scope of services of advocates accountants and other professionals uh ibbi and ipas both are taking action for for ensuring that insolvency professionals perform well they perform within the bounds of law so a lot of regulatory actions have been taken there have been certain capacity constraints in terms of nclt uh some of the vacancies are there which is basically uh, and the co- case load is ever increasing uh you will be amazed to know that lot of interlocutory applications are filed so in a case uh and an on an average 5 to 10 applications interlocutory applications are there so a lot of litigation basically brings down the decision making process of the nclt and this has led to large pendencies and they are not ad- ad- able to adhere to the timelines uh the there have been delays i will not do, dwell into statistics uh we have as a result of this ibc we have been able to create a new institution called information utility so any sl is uh, national e services limited is the util- information utility utility which is a product of this code uh here basically all the financial all the creditors submit information of loans debt as well as default to the information utility it sends this information to the companies so that they can authenticate that information and once that company gives a in, uh, authenticates that information they give the response then this information is again shared with the creditor so if any default happens and it if it is confirmed then basically that default is communicated to all a default record of default is generated and it is communicated to all so e- all creditors then get to know that this company is defaulting one should be careful in its dealings so this is one in new institution which has been created by ibc so i can go on and on but lot of things have happened since the uh, creation of ibc and lot is yet to happen because still resolution is resolution of companies is taking time but we as a regulator as well as the government is aware of the difficulties and we are working over time that we are a, so that we are able to resolve the issue the number of amendments done both to the code as well as to the regulations are a preview to that that we have been able to respond to the market challenges in fact one of the accusation has been that we have been too proactive uh, probably we are meddling the affairs too much so that is an accusation at uh, at us but this is a code which requires uh, to be to keep pace with the market otherwise we will not be able to justify that ibc uh, recently honorable fm had said in her address that ibc should not lose its sheen and we are all working towards it thank you